Well, good morning, everyone. Let, let me first admit uh, that the real expert in my group is Gareth Hines on fuel cells. Uh, Gareth is a meeting in Lisbon, so I'm really a stand-in for Gareth today, and uh, I hope I'll do a good job. And whether I'll be able to answer all the questions as well, Gareth, is another matter. What I want to put across today is a couple of examples where we've done some innovative research to try and accelerate the development and commercialisation of uh, polymer um, electrolyte membrane fuel cells. There are a range of possible fuel cell systems. Uh, the one that we have focused on is the, the polymer electrolyte membrane or the proton exchange membrane. The reason for that is the p potential use in motor vehicle applications, which has then will be a very extensive um, um, uptake of these, uh, that technology. Just a very simple sort of cartoon vision of uh, how this works. So basically you've got hydrogen from some source, whether it's from electrolysis or a renewable system or from steam uh, methane reformation. Uh, that hydrogen will be oxidized at the catalyst. It then produces hydrogen ions that moves through the, the membrane. It's then reduced with oxygen and you get water as a byproduct. That's, that's how it works at the, um, the kind of Mickey Mouse cartoon session, um, version. Underpinning that, of course, is a fairly complex process, uh, and you have, if I use this pointer, I hope you can see, you have the flow channel, which is carrying the fuel or, or air, as the case may be. The, the key thing is you want that fuel to be distributed uniformly to the catalyst, so you put the, the, the gas diffusion layer in. That has three functions. It provides electrical continuity between the catalyst and the current collector. It also gets rid of water efficiently and also it transfers the, uh, the fuel to the catalyst in the most diverse and efficient manner. The challenging part is this section here. Now, to minimise the use of platinum, it's obviously expensive material, uh, we've got platinum catalyst particles which are typically 2 to 3 nanometers mounted on 30 nanometer carbon particles. And these then have to provide electrical continuity. So they have to be packed closely enough to provide electrical continuity. At the same time, you have to have ionic continuity because you have to transfer hydrogen ions through the system. So interspersed with these particles is the ionomer or the polymer, uh, uh, conducting polymer. So you can see there's an interesting challenge here. You've got to get interspersion of the polymer. At the same time, you have to have electrical conductivity. So it's ionic conductivity simultaneous with, with electrical conductivity. And you've got to get the gases in and the water out. So it's actually a challenging system to design these. And Johnson and Matthew are probably the world leaders to some extent in developing these with, with high efficiency. That's the principle how the system works. Um, in terms of this technology readiness level, I, I put this at, at I and mean, we'd had a discussion in Telly about this with Gareth about this, and the, the, the issue here is that at one level we're at a mature technology insofar as they're putting fuel cells into cars and they're testing them and running these things. At the other level, we're doing fundamental research and developing new catalysts, and those who keep an eye on the literature in the, in the newspapers, there's been a real advance in terms of developing a platinum nickel catalyst, maybe 10 times more efficient than the existing platinum catalyst. So that really is a break through coming at a very early stage of development, but in terms of the broad technology, I think we're at level seven. That would be our judgment. And the reason for that is that there are still major barriers. If you like, this is where the valley of death is. You've got to overcome these barriers to become commercially viable. And there's three aspects of that. It's the cost, durability, and, and the refueling. In terms of cost, I, I, I don't think this is going to be a real big obstacle. I think the rate of development in innovative technology here is so rapid in terms of new catalyst materials, system design, I don't see the cost. And the cost requirement is to get to $36 per kilowatt, which is equivalent to an internal combustion in engine. And that will be, I, I don't see a long term to do that. Refueling is a more critical issue because in parallel with the cost, you've got to have uptake of the cars, which you need a, a refueling infrastructure. But there's now is a UK hydrogen mobility program, which is designed to project into the future how we're going to integrate industry and government to establish a refueling network within the UK. And the plans are already in place. The Germans are ahead of us. We've been doing that since 2009. Um, the idea is that by 2050, we'll have something like about 30% of motor vehicles which are running on fuel cells. That, that's a projection. But of course, a lot of things have to work in tandem to make that, that, that um, effective. The area that we've been focusing on our own research is uh, the issue of durability. It's no good putting a fuel cell in place if it only lasts two or three years. It has to have a very long life. And for that matter, we have to understand what causes the, uh, um, loss, of durability, the loss of functionality, which, which undermining the, um, the operation of the system. Part of the problem there is that we don't actually really have a very good, or we haven't had a good measurement system for really characterizing the degradation in an operating system. 
There's also no standardised test methodology, so I think we heard about standards this morning. Um, you can't develop standards really sensibly until you understand what is going on. And then if standards evolve, once you understand enough to know what the, re the relevant test parameters are, then you can develop efficient standards. Now, Mark Holmes referred to the issue of establishing connectivity and, and collaboration networks. We're particularly good at that in the fuel cells area. Within the context of the work we get funded by the National Measurement System for the, um, the basic research, we have what is called uh, an IAG, the Industrial Advisory Group, and we're connected to all the leading researchers within the, sorry, the, the leading industry organisations within the UK. And basically we have six months meetings. We transfer our recent research to them. They feed back the issues and challenges they've got within their own industry and adapt in that research to best practice. Uh, and that's what works extraordinarily well. The other aspect is technology strategy board programs. And we have been engaged in the recent one looking at different aspects of durability where each partner looks at one particular component that leads to degradation of a, of a fuel cell. The other key thing is that, that while we're working very closely with all the UK companies, we have to ensure we have a good network and relationship with what is happening in Europe to ensure the transfer of information in, in and out of the UK. So we have an information network which is established uh, with European partners. And the idea of that is providing information across barriers, but also to ensure that SMEs have a resource they can go to in terms of actually getting information or, for that matter, doing any testing or getting testing done. And the, third, the last aspect is engaging with the universities. Some of the really bright um, scientists there uh, are evolving <coughs> continually new ideas. What we are doing is funding some of the PhDs and postdocs and NHDs so that we are building a complementary complementary approach to the research based on what we're doing in the measurement side with innovative ideas coming through the universities. So that connectivity and collaborative aspect is a real key part of how we're working and how we're showing the research actually makes an impact on the industry. Now, I, I'm not going to go through all these in detail, but what I want to do is highlight two examples where the research we're doing, I think, is impacted uh, upon... I'm not sure how clear that is from here. Um, impacted upon the industry. The, the two aspects I'm going to focus on in particular are in relation to developing a real novel uh, measurement of electrical potential and also a method of measuring uh, active surface area. I just mentioned in passing this particular piece of work because it's really a breakthrough in measurement at the time. This is to measure in situ the actual humidity in an operation fuel cell. And water management of fuel cells is critical. If you get any liquid water in the system, then the gases don't get fused so, through easily. So controlling the water management is absolutely critical. But the first time we'd be able to put in uh, humidity sensors and actually characterize that in some detail. And that's really made an important breakthrough uh, in the measurement process. We also got to make sure that the bipolar plates would stand the, uh, the uh, environment within a fuel cell. And been, for many years, there's been misleading ideas about what is the environment a bipolar plate size. And in the, the assumption has always been that it's pH 1 sulfuric acid because inside the ionomer, that is the environment, but that has no theoretical possibility of ever um, contacting a bipolar plate in that context. So we've actually identified a much more sensible view of what the environment is in, the, in, in, in relation to an operation fuel cell. And the last of these is just the, the modelling. The idea is that we are developing a multi-scale, multi-physics model here, which we're going to roll out with console. The idea is to transfer that to the industry, who we're actually working closely with, uh, where they can do some sort of preliminary tests of any prototype development. So what I want to do... Oops. Just some two there. It's just focused on two examples uh, of where we develop measurement tools to try and help industry address particular problems. One of the major issues, as far as the current design is concerned, is corrosion during startup and shutdown. And basically that corrosion manifests itself as corrosion of the carbon. You remember the platinum sits on the carbon. If the carbon corrodes and it converts to CO2, you're losing that functionality of there. The problem occurs during startup and shutdown. Now, anybody who's familiar with operating plant, whether it's on the... Uh, uh, a, a power plant, a chemical plant, or even a fuel cell, is that up is always a critical issue because controlling the environment is always the most challenging aspect. Here we have a situation where during startup you have oxygen in the system because you get air into the system, into the fuel line, and basically we then have hydrogen going through the system here. And you've got that interface, and that interface causes a drive in electro potential for the system, and, and it causes corrosion. Now we understand that the, in order for the carbon to corrode, the potential, the electrical potential of the system which determines whether the thing corrodes or not has to be relatively high, but no one's been able to measure it at all. And what people have been trying to do in terms of measuring it, they use different techniques. They use this called an edge-type uh, reference electrode. Basically, they connect it to the edge of the ionomer. 
It has intrinsic uh, limitations because of potential drops in the system. It has limitations because it measures the average of the system. So people then devise a different method, which is put a sandwich in. And basically the problem there is that you put an interface in there between two sections of the membrane, you disturb it. And the whole fundamental process of in-situ measurement is you do, measurement process should never disturb the thing you're trying to measure. And the sandwich, it, it inevitably does. The novelty of the MPL approach, which is sort of based on work that we did in corrosion many, many years ago, is to, to insert the electrodes through the flow field, through the GTL, to interface with the membrane in an indirect way. And this is, without going into the fine details of this, because it's not such a detailed technical uh, meeting, but basically this is, a, uh, it says, in essence, the hydrogen electrode, which goes through the very different stages um, of the actual fuel cell, uh, and to, as I say, to interface with the actual ionomer. And this is a bit like spaghetti junction, but this is what it looks like here in, in an operational system. Um, the importance of having that number is that we want to look at the distribution of potential. So we have nine electrodes in the system. And we also play around looking at the current voltage response as we're making a measurement to make sure the measurement doesn't perturb the current voltage. At the same time, we change the number of reference electrodes so that we're confident that nothing we're doing is actually perturbing what we're measuring. And that's actually essential with any in situ um, uh, Measurement. Now, I just want to very briefly, if I can get this working, and I hope it works here. In the... <laughs> Never trust yourself to have anybody upload. Uh, well, okay, I'll just have to talk you through this, and you have to use a lot of imagination, because this is a little video that, as usual, fails when you, when you try to do these things. And, um, basically, if, what, what is happening, and I'll have to talk you through, you lose your imagination here, by the way. Hydrogen is coming through on the anode side. Now, the corrosion occurs not in... Not on the, um, the anode side, the corrosion occurs on the, the other side, on the cathode. Although the hydrogen and oxygen are meeting on the anode side, it actually drives the corrosion on the cathode side where the oxygen is, where the air is. And basically what you would see if you could see this video, and it's quite a nice little video I have to see, but basically you would see these three regions as the hydrogen moves through would start to decrease, and these regions here, the potential would increased to about 1.5 volts. Normally it's set about a volt, but they would increase to 1.5. I apologize for the video. I, next time I want to bring my own to stick and make sure it doesn't uh, um, in affect it. But anyway, I think the key conclusion now is that uh, this is not just a, a measurement system that we're using at MPL. We've actually uh, transferred that to the uh, key industry people who are now actually using it. And Ed Brightman, who works with Gareth in that group, has been out there showing them how to use that sort of measurement technology in order to um, screen potential engineers. You can solve this problem, but you have to engineer your solutions. And we all have different ideas how to do that. The virtue of this system is you can actually test it while you're doing it in a very simple way. So that, that was just one example of how we use uh, measurement tools to help the industry characterize, in that case, degradation due to corrosion. One of the other key aspects, actually fundamental aspect, is what is the effective uh, surface area of the plant? And the active area, the part that takes place, that, that actually does all the reacting process. We use it, to, what we're interested in is what we call the electrochemical surface area of the platinum available. Now that's affected by two issues. When you construct these things, of course, you've got a problem, as I said, you've got ionomers interspersing, you've got to get the gas through, uh, and you've got to have the, the right balance in your um, membrane electrolyte assembly to make sure the platinum is utilized. You know how much you put in, you want to make sure it's all active. The other key thing that happens is that over time, you get sintering. Sintering is kind of like the platinum particles move and then begin to coalesce, and so you lose the surface area over time. We were taking part in this technology strategy board and the fundamental challenge we had is can you come up with a method of determining the effective surface area in a cell inside a stack which is about 300 cells and can you do that simply? And this is a challenge, I have to say, my, I'm very impressed with my colleagues in my group for doing this. The, I, I won't go through the electrochemistry but, but basically the normal method is to use what they call cyclic voltammetry. And you can use that for a single cell where you apply a potential, you measure a current, and for various ways of doing that, you can work out this, the monolayer coverage of hydrogen and the surface area. You can't apply that to stack because a stack operates under current control. What the guys have done, and I won't go into the details of that, is they simply set up a system, what they call a galvanic static test, where they can polarize the current in one direction, switch the current, and looking at the analysis of the potential gradient, they can work out what the effective surface area of the actual operating platen is in the system. And just to finish off, to emphasize that these are, these are important advances, 
That technique has already been adopted as a diagnostic tool for stack performance. The idea, the vision is that you would be able to put something in an actual operating vehicle and you could check your, your power system. You could go on to a garage and they could look at your system and they can tell which of the cells in your stack are actually malfunctioning and then replace them and keep the whole thing going. And if I use that quote by Simon Foster, which I think is a very neat quote, and it's not prompting by the way, by the way it's a, like measuring the wearing systems without taking the engine power. It's a really powerful technique the guys have developed. And the virtue of it is really, really simple to apply. Uh, okay, I think what I've done now, I hope, is just to give, convey the idea that, that by developing measurement techniques, we give industry solutions which overcome this so-called valley of death. Essentially, I don't think of valley of death, I think of the barriers to further development in a cost-effective way.